If you brought your Bibles, you can open up uh, and go to two primary passages. We're going to cover a lot of scripture and it'll be displayed on the board. But two primary passages. One will be in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And then the other one will be in Psalm 139. That will be towards the end of the, the time of sharing. So uh, before we begin and open up and get into God's word, let's, let's pray. Jesus, you are the word and the embodiment of it. And so we pray that as we peer into your word, which is living, it is powerful, discerns, gets it, and gets us. We pray that, uh, Holy Spirit, that as we get into a time of study and looking into it, that you would be the ultimate teacher. Uh, each of my brothers and sisters come here with their own story. And so you are the king of their souls. You know how to speak into them, how to touch them as only you can, for you made them. And so we pray, word of God, that you would have your way. Be the lion from the tribe of Judah, zinging and blessing and touching hearts as only you can. And so we lift this time up to you. Thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about something that as a non-believer, as somebody who didn't know Jesus for the first 23 years of my life, I struggled with. It was a real battle within me. And then coming to know Christ was this glorious, I would call it like a year, year and a half of my life where there was absolute freedom. And there was a joy that I did not know, a, a peace that uh, was unexplainable. It surprised me. There was so much freedom in that. And I didn't wrestle with the things that I had before, but like I said, it was about a brief year, year and a half, and then I started to struggle with it again. And these cycles started to come back in. And I would venture to say that I'm not atypical, but that I am very typical. And if we think about it, many of us, from the time that we were little, little kids to, to now, we wrestle with this thing called identity. Who are we? And what am I? And what is my purpose? And from the time that you and I were little squeakers, there was this sense of wanting to know that. We wanted to uh, get that about ourselves and to, to also rest in it. And so until that happens, you and I are on this pursuit and, and uh, we wrestle. How we see ourselves and how we perceive ourselves will determine our actions, how we act, and how we think, and how we are. I came across a quote from a, a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Boa. He wrote a book called Confor Conform to His Image, and he says this, quote, we cannot consistently behave in ways that are, not, that are different from what we believe about ourselves. Now, here's where the, the problem comes, and... And if we're not careful, we uh, cannot be in alignment. We will not be in alignment. And we will walk around with a limp. Now, I don't know if you've ever had your back out of, out of sorts, or maybe your neck, or some part of your body that just is not functioning well, right? But you know what it is to walk like this and to be kinked up, and you're not in proper alignment, and so you're not able to be yourself. In fact, you get pretty preoccupied with your kink and being out of alignment, right? We've all felt that. And there's nothing worse than, than not being yourself. What happens is, is you and I can live in frustration because if we're not aligned in our true identity, then there's going to be this wrestling because there's going to be competing identities going on within you. There's going to be a conflict. And what can happen is you can get depressed because you're not yourself. You're not in proper alignment. And that is something that we will struggle with. Now, there's this great movie, one of my favorites. Uh, it's called The Bourne Identity. And the main character in that is Jason Bourne. And Jason Bourne is amazing. I mean, if you've got 
any sense of testosterone in here today, you want to be Jason Bourne because this guy can do just about anything in any situation and come out of it on top. You give him a rolled up magazine in his hand and a ballpoint pen and he can fight, right? He's dangerous. And so Jason uh, is techno savvy. He knows how to do a bunch of things. Well, he goes on this mission and it fails. He ends up getting shot twice and he goes unconscious, floating out at sea. And then he's um, rescued and he wakes up, but he doesn't know who he is. He has no idea of his name, doesn't know, doesn't know his identity. But he soon quickly starts to discover that he is loaded with all kinds of capacities to do a bunch of different things. He's got skill sets that are innumerable. And he's also very smart and sharp. Now, rather than being, kind of, uh, being enamored with these things and overcome by them, really what bugs him the most is, I want to know who I am. I want to know my identity. And so he pursues that, and he, he goes to all, in fact, all three episodes, he's trying to find out, who am I? Who am I? Got all this stuff. But who, I, who am I? That's what matters the most. Now, just like the song that debuted in 1980, some of you old enough might appreciate this, Looking for Love, we also can look for our identity in all the wrong places. Okay? Some of us look for our, our identity in our career. How important am I? What kind of position do I have? We can take on positions on boards of organizations or some kind of company. Maybe it's your athletic ability. And uh, if you're over the age of, I'm going to guess, 35 or 40, it's the good old days when I used to be able to do that and this and all the right, right? That athletic ability. Maybe it's your mental prowess or your talent things that you do really well, that you're wired to do. You can look for your identity through your marriage, maybe your kids, or what you own, your possessions. And it could be through your hobbies, because you can do your hobbies really well. And so if you're not careful, you can find your identity in all of those things. But here's the problem with all of those things I just mentioned, is they can and will at some point fail you. Because you might not always have the job you have now, and you might not always get the promotion that you think you should get because you've worked hard for it, and it got passed by you. You might even lose your job. Or one day, you retired, and you wake up going, what is my worth? No longer working. It could be that athletically, you can't do the things that you used to do. I can't throw a baseball like I used to because my arm just flat out hurts. When I do that, I can't run or jump as high. I just can't. It's the agility's gone. Mental prowess. Boy, who can say that you're as sharp as you were when you were 20 or 25? I mean, it just, it just doesn't happen, right? So that can't be where your identity is. Maybe you've hit a bump in your marriage. And so when that goes south or that goes through that rough patch, your identity can be messed with there. Possessions, they rust, they break down. Instead of you possessing your possessions, they possess you. And that's a rough go. Here's the, the, the trouble with all of that. When things are going well with all of those things I just mentioned, then it's good. And you feel good about yourself. You feel good about your identity because you're so tied to them. And if they're good, well, that's great. Everything's fine. But if they're not good, and if there's a turn in any of those things, then things aren't great. And it's a rough go. And that's a tough pillow. It's a hard pillow to lay your head on at the end of the day. Now, here's the deal. With all of those things, it is so horizontal. It's on this kind of plane. And a lot of it is performance-based. Your identity, if you're not careful, is based upon how well you perform. 
And if you're really good at a lot of those things on that list, and you perform at a very high level, well, you become very self-reliant. I've got this. I can handle this. And the problem with that is the word what? I. Because that's not vertically aligned. None of those things are vertically aligned. It's horizontal, and it's all performance-based. That's the trouble with that list. Proper alignment for you and I as believers is to be vertically aligned. Because when we are, we are good and right. And there is no frustration or shouldn't be any frustration or, or less frustration because our identity is right and where it should be. Now think back when you, when you first got saved. What was your life like prior to accepting Jesus into your heart? What were the things that you were doing? What was the way that you thought and processed things? What were your actions? What were the activities that you were involved in? And then think about the day that you invited Christ into your life. Now, the amazing thing is this. It's the reality of it, which is a mind blower, is Romans chapter 8 comes alive. What is that? Romans 8, verse 11 says, well, when you accepted Christ to be your Savior, the Holy Spirit came inside of you. Came in. Now, here's how the Bible describes that event or what happened. The very one that rose Jesus from the dead, that raised him from the dead, that showed up on the tomb, which we'll celebrate next weekend, the one that came to that tomb and raised Jesus from the dead, this is what the Bible says. He lives in you now. That is power. That is, how, how can that happen and come into you and not change you? That's the question. I would venture to say it's impossible. Now, for some of us, that change was pretty dramatic. I mean, poof, a lot of things changed really quick. And for some of us, it might have been more gradual. But here's the bottom line. Change had to happen, and change did happen. Because now you're thinking different. You react differently. You are different. You have now your true identity. Why? Because it's vertical. It wasn't before, but now it is. Why? Because Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And that's where the proper alignment comes from. Now, here's the big problem, is things get out of alignment. Now, we take our focus off the vertical, and then we make it more about ourselves. But you see, it's always to be about Jesus. It used to be self-centered, now it's Jesus-centered. Ephesians 2, the passage I told you to open up to, Ephesians 2 says this, verses 8 through 10. It says, For grace, by grace you've been saved. Through what? Faith, not of works. It's not from yourselves. It is a what? A gift of God. Not by any works. Nothing you, you ever could do so that you could not boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amazing. By grace, God saved your soul. He allowed you to come in to his kingdom. The Bible also declares this in the same chapter, that you and I couldn't do this on our own, because it also says that you and I were dead in our trespasses. Dead can't choose life. You're dead. Spiritually, we were dead. But God ripped this veil open, if you would. And he says, hey, hey, I'm going to let you come alive and see and know that there's life and to invite us into it. That's when we became born again by his grace. Nothing you did deserved that. And the problem with some of us is we think that we were a worthy candidate 
of God choosing us. And that's self-reliance. That's a vertical, that not, that's not vertical, that's horizontal thinking. This kind of thinking. Because, and then it's also this kind of thinking about yourself. But God says, nope, I saved you by grace. You didn't have a thing to do with it. When he did, new identity. And that began the pursuit, the realization, the discovery of the understanding of what it means for you and I to be born again and to have our identity in Christ. The challenge in this message was to really narrow it down to what are those things that identify us with Christ. Because if you look back into the Old Testament, it's replete with all kinds of things that God says about us, towards us. The Psalms are dripping with this beautiful description of our identity in him. You get into the New Testament and you watch Jesus as he's interacting with people, how he's tenderly addressing them and invading the world and healing them and speaking words of life. People hung on his words because he was validating people. He was saving people. He was healing people. He was raising them from the dead and he was speaking words of life into them. The word of life became flesh, dwelt, dwelt amongst us, and they were hearing this message. Radically changed them. He validated people. It goes on. The epistles of of uh, Paul, you read the writings of John, you read the writings of Peter and James, and God is just continuing to identify and let us know who we are in Christ. Now, I can't go through the exhaustive list. Now, this is funny because my message is on the uh, messages on the identity we have in Christ. I was in the cafe last night, and I was walking by somebody, and, and I saw this pink piece of paper. So it obviously didn't come from the man tent outside. It came from the women's boutique right over there in the cafe, right? But it was right there on the table. And I looked at it and it says, who we are in Christ. Now, so that all of this could be lined up on one page, she had to put it in like, I don't know, six font. But here's the list. That list is long. But here's, here's the, the, the mind blower. As long as this list is, it's not comprehensive. It isn't the full list. It's in part. But for the sake of putting it on one page, she had to limit who we are in Christ. It's an amazing thing. I'm going to go over just a few of them. First off, when you got saved, you became a new creation. Brand new. Whatever was in the past is in the past you got to reckon, reckon it in the past. Don't carry it into the future. Don't carry it into today. The Bible says God looks at you as new. The old is gone. You've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. You no longer live, but it's Christ in you who lives. He is helping you to live. He's helping you to think. He's helping you to be. Here's a biggie. Romans 8, verse 1, you're not condemned. If you are in Christ, you are not condemned. You and I will say, but. And then we'll add in the script, but. And God has no buts in that script. And take away the but, no. There is no condemnation. If you're in Christ, you're not condemned. Whatever sin you committed is covered by the blood of Jesus. That's how perfect it is. And that's who you are in Christ. Receive that. All of God's promises, every one of them, all of them, not some, not based upon performance. You get more. No, you get all of them. That is in Ephesians chapter 1. All of the blessings of Christ are yours if you are in Christ. He gives you the strength for all things. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Whatever you're going through, whatever situation you find yourself in, He is our strength for that time. If you're taking a test, if you're going to play some sporting event, if you're going to get up here on a stage and try to be, 
right? Say some words. If you're going to have a tough situation that you're in, having to go through, God says, I give you the strength for that. Don't look within yourself for the strength. I'm your strength. God has begun a good work in you. Philippians chapter 1. It says he began that good work in you. And here's what he says. He's faithful to complete it. Notice who's doing the work. It is God. It is not you. You're his workmanship. And he does not give up on you and I. He is changing us, writing continually this wonderful God story within us. He has set us free. John chapter 8, verse 32. He has set you free. He also says that I'm, you are his priest. 1 Peter chapter 2. You're his servant. You are his chosen one. He chose you. Who remembers being on the playground or wanting to be invited to a, uh, some party or some event? You wanted to be chosen, picked. I wanted to be picked by my wife. I chose her. That's powerful. God chose you. He meant to. He calls us his child. 1 John chapter 3. He says, you're my, my kiddo. I have adult kids. If you have four, they're all adults. Uh, youngest is 21. But I think of them as, when I talk about my kids, I'm thinking of them as three and four and five. That's that tender spot, right? When you say child, that's, that's a term of endearment, right? And that's how God sees you and I, his child. God delights in your well-being, Psalm 35. He delights in how you're doing. Psalm 36 says, well, there's this abundance that I give to you so that there's satisfaction within your soul. Psalm 36 says that. He brings us to his river of delights. And he gives us drink that's refreshing to the soul. He is the fountain of life, Psalm 36. He wants us to come to him who is the fountain of everything that we have need of. Now, that's a glorious list. It's short, by the way, right? It's short. But just feast on those things. Think about it. It's dynamic. It's real. If you are a believer in Christ today, those are for you and I. It is not about self-help. It's not about making you feel good about yourself, looking in the mirror and convincing yourself that you're great and that everyone loves you. It's not that. It's about your vertical alignment in him, about who he is, what he has done, and what he has given to you and I out of love. It's vertical alignment. It has nothing to do with making you feel better about yourself, but to be aligned with him. If you and I can take those verses and live in those passages and take him at his word, that honors him. It honors him to believe him. That if you make that statement, Lord, if you say that ab about your saints, then I want to believe that. That is like childlike faith. Because you and I can write the script and make the list long as to why you disqualify yourself or dismiss yourself from ever having the opportunity of experiencing the reality of those verses. Faith becomes faith when I say in light of who I am, he declares this about me, and I want to live in it. That honors God the most. It glorifies God because you are taking him at his word. Here's the problem. This is what's, what's the challenge here. Is that you may say amen to the list, and you may say, yeah, that's great. I've got the books. Heard the sermons. Man, I'm just wrestling. Yep. But you and I will somehow sidestep the reality of these verses. 
if we're not careful. And we may not experience them in our lives. Why is that? It's because our view has been taken off a vertical alignment and we get back into the horizontal. And then we get into performance. What wars against our identity in Christ? I'm going to name at least three things. There are more, but these are three biggies, I would say. Uh, the most probably effective to get your eyes off of who you are in Christ and diminish you, demoralize you, and discourage you. What are those three enemies? The first one is we have an enemy called Satan. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that he's like a roaring lion looking to what? To cuddle up against? No, he wants to devour you. He wants to chew you up, rip you apart. He also, Jesus described him in John 8, 44, he says, no, he's the father of lies. That's his nature. He lies. There's the movie called The Lion King, right? And what does Scar do? Scar is a liar. He's the uncle of Simba. And he goes to Simba and he says, you know what, Simba? You're the reason why your dad died. And he just plaques that on him. He says, your dad died because of you. And Simba believes him and takes that in. The enemy lies to you. He deceives. Now, he knows just a few things. He doesn't know all things. Do not give him too much credit, but respect him nonetheless. Because he is formidable. And he's tricky. And he seeks only to do one thing, and that is to destroy you. That's his game plan. That's why the Bible says, whenever you hear those words coming against you that are demeaning, demoralizing, and diminishing, you and I have to <clears throat> take that thought captive. Say, no, and don't give it a long leash. Don't write a paragraph. Don't write a chapter. Don't write a book. Nope. Pew. As quick as it comes in, if it's not the language of the scriptures, then you take it captive. <clears throat> not from you. Not from you. And I say out loud, no. I just, nope, not going to do that. Nope, not going to think that. Nope, lie. You have to do that. Otherwise, it's a horrible day or a horrible hour, right? Who hasn't had that because we've listened to the lie? The second thing that wars against you and I and our identity in Christ is the sin nature, which we referred to as the mole a couple months ago when talking about the sin nature. It's the mole. The mole is conniving. The mole is secretive. The mole is self-serving, self-gratifying, self-interested. And it is in you and me. It's in every one of us. You and I were born with it. Paul, Super Saint Paul, in Romans 7 and 8 would say, the mole is it. It's that. It's in me. I want to do good, and that makes me sin. My sin nature causes me to sin. And Paul, Paul te talks about it almost like a cancer, like an it entity. It's that. And he says, every time I want to do good, that wars against it. It wants to be God. It's all about self. And anything to keep us from God, because see, the sin nature is thwarted when you and I draw close to God. Whenever you and I are, are pursuing the Lord and wanting to be more like him, the sin nature has, uh, it takes exception to that. It wars against that. It doesn't want that to happen because it loses power. It loses grip. It loses control. And again, you say no. Because the sin nature unlike Satan, is with you 24-7. Because it's in you, you and I woke up to it. Now, I asked this question last night. It's funny what the reaction was. I said, who of you woke up 
or have woken up, let's say over the last month, and have felt condemned right out of the gates. You wake up, you're dumpy, you're sad, you're demoralized, you're, you're carrying the sins of yesterday into today, and you feel condemned. Anyone here over the last month? Yeah, see, there's only one or two honest souls, right? Because, I mean, I thought they were super saints last night because I thought, well, no, Sunday's going to be honest. They're all going to raise their hand. But we do. And the sin nature is the one keeping track. It keeps record of wrongs, sins, things you could have, would have, should have done. Just does that. That's what the sin nature does. It's conniving. I think it's the biggest enemy, by the way. Because you have that 24-7. Doesn't like you following God. Thirdly, the enemy of our identity in Christ, that vertical alignment, is people. People. Matthew 5 says, well, Jesus speaking, he says... You are blessed if you're persecuted. You're blessed if you're insulted. You are blessed if you're maligned because of your identity with me. If people persecute you, you are blessed. People do that. It happens in the church. Happens outside the church. They can be your friends. It can be nice people. It can be mean people. It can be your family. It can be your parents. Can you remember when anyone in that list said something to your face, behind your back, purposed, non-purposed, intentional or unintentional. I think what hurts the most, it's when it's people closest to you, maybe that you would call a friend or somebody that you love, somebody that you respect. And when those words come, they're like barbs. Barbs on a hook, they just stick. And the problem is, you can remember them decades later. You can remember, and it still hurts. And when those words come back and what was done is still lingering, it, it just diminishes, demoralizes, discourages, you and I. And then we base our identity in Christ on the horizontal because of what they said or what they did. It can be verbal, which is what happens a lot of time to us, but it also can be nonverbal. It's what they didn't do, but they should have done. It could be what they did do and they shouldn't have done. So the enemy of our True identity in Christ can be also nonverbal and gets us away from that proper alignment. The thing that we have to be careful of is Jesus says, make sure you're careful and measured with your words. David says, put a, a guard over my mouth before I speak. Just put a trap over it. Give me like two seconds of thought. Is this helpful? Is it true? Is it needful? Is it kind? He says, be careful with your words because they'll be, you'll be held to account for what you say. Sidebar note, just a, just a thought. For us parents, grandparents, our kids and our grandkids, I don't care how old they are, they hang on every kind affirming word that you say to them. They put it under their pillow at night, so to speak. Because if you affirm them and you say loving words to them, that's like medicine. Proverbs says this, 
Those kind words are like medicine to the bones. They affect you spiritually but they, and mentally, but they also affect you physiologically. Those words. So help us to be careful and measured with our words and look for ways to affirm our kids, our grandkids, and I would say to one another. How can we live in our true identity in Christ? Because those three enemies are formidable. They are always with us and will be with us until we die, unfortunately. How can we live in this true alignment of identity in Christ? It's always going to come back to this. What matters the most? Is it what my God says about me? Or is it what the enemy thinks about me? Or what my sin nature thinks about me? Or what people think of me? What matters the most? There is an incredible work that Max Licato, many of you know who he is. He's a great author, very prolific author. I like how he frames things and brings you and I into the story and we get it in very simplistic terms and it's powerful. This is a book that we bought for our kids when they were just little, little guys, little squeakers growing up. And it's a message that I think is even more powerful for us as adults. So how is it that you and I can live in our true identity in Christ? And this is how Max Licato puts it in this book called You Are Special. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore, others wore coats, but all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the streets all over the city, people spent their day sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Others, though, could do little. They got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around him and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. And after a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him one for no reason at all. He deserves a lot of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden, wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. The few times he went outside, he hung around the other Wemmicks, who had a lot of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he met a Wemmick who was unlike he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. 
Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the women admire Lucia for not having any dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless woman how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go to see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill. He's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear her. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself, and he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the large shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here, and he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello? The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little Wemmick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked, up, picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker thought, spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you have been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other women think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give dots or stars? They're women just like you. What, you. what you think doesn't matter, or what they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are pretty special. Punch in hell laughed. Me special? Why? My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never heard anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. Oh, I know. She told me about you. Why don't the sticker stick on her? The, the maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will but it takes time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you and show you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, 
Eli said as the Wemmick walked out the door. You are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. Punching a little stopped, but in his heart, he thought, I think he really means it. And with that, a dot fell to the ground. In the story is just the most beautiful picture of the Lord wanting for you and I to be in the presence of his voice in an atmosphere of how he thinks about you and I and how he made us just as we are and that he made us on purpose that we have value according to him. The more that you and I train ourselves, purpose ourselves, determine ourselves to go into the presence of the King, of our Lord, the more that you and I enjoy that dialogue and that wonderful narrative in our souls. The more that you and I bask in that, all the more different do we think about ourselves and we get aligned. The more that you and I hear the words of Jesus spoken into our hearts because we've set aside time daily, is the more that he is able to write that narrative of truth and reality into us and how he thinks. It's the scriptures themselves. For you and I to be be aware, to bathe ourselves in them, to receive them, to live in them, and the reality that changes everything. Before we go into the word, we're one way. But when we spend time in his presence and go through the word, and the word goes through us, we lead differently, just like Punchinello did, having been in the presence of Eli, a dot came off. But also, stars will come off. You won't be thinking so much about yourself. You won't be in self-reliance. You won't be in performance-based theology that's outward on the horizontal. No, you'll be aligned vertically. And what matters the most is what Jesus thinks of you and I. It will take a will and determination to do that because you're going to have the war that wars against you about your worthiness and about whether or not you can. The mole's going to be there chipping away. And then you're going to remember those thoughts that people have said about you. But you know what? No. You bring all of that. You come humbly before our maker. You articulate the things that are here, the things that are troubling you here, and you just bring them before him. But he rewrites your story. And he brings you into alignment. That is freedom, folks. That is freedom. That is joy. That is peace. That's what I venture that all of us here in this room want. It's because the king, when he speaks those words, they're life. They're life-giving. It changes your perspective about everything about who you are. And what matters the most is him. Think about these words, Psalm 139, mind blower. Psalm 139 says this, you, God, created me, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He made you fearfully and wonderfully. No exceptions. He knit you together. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious 
how precious are your thoughts about me? How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That's the language in the narrative of our God and King that oversees your life. He made you on purpose. If he wanted you to be someone else, he would have made you someone else. He wired you. He gave you your personality. And just like Eli said in the book, he makes no mistakes. To celebrate that reality of who we are in him is the most freeing thing that we can do and be but to take him at his word. We've learned that our true identity is to be in Jesus. We've learned that we have an enemy or enemies that were against that. But we also have learned how we can live in our true identity and how God wants us to live in that. And there's one that would give a personal testimony of, of how with competing identities can lead to frustration and to depression, the more that we do those things, we go to that workshop, the more those things fall off. Brightens your day. It changes the way you think and then the way you act. The grip of depression loosens and you walk in the freedom of who you are in Christ. That is good stuff. Amen? pray. So Jesus, I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters and I to embrace your words, your truths, to live in them, to experience them. Help us to be careful to pay attention more to who you say we are in you and how you have designed and purposed us to be in alignment with you than anything else. Help us to, to be free from the shackles and the, the snares of the works of our enemies. Help us to live in your freedom. Help us to desire your word, which rewrites our story beautifully and powerfully. Help us to live in the, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is in us, giving us strength, the power to live for you with an audience of one, the power to live successfully in the kingdom and to honor you the most. Help my brothers and sisters and I with this. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.